Hi, in this video, I want to show you one of my books. This is Elements of Complex Analysis, and it's by Sonishin and Green. And this is a book I've had for a very long time. And I used it uh, as a supplement when I took complex analysis. So let's just take a look at it and go through like some of the math that's in this book. Let's open it up. So this one is from 1977. That's a while ago. And then chapter zero is really interesting. It's algebraic and topological preliminaries. And I mean, let's just go through these topics and we'll talk about where else they might appear because these are preliminaries. So you get a really diverse set of topics here. So set theory, logical symbols, sets and functions, stuff like this, uh, and maybe sequences and countable sets, you would see um, in a proof writing class. Okay, and you also see logics and sets, or sets at least at, at the beginning of most advanced math books. They usually have like something preliminary where they talk about sets and functions. And this one also talks about logical symbols and sequences and countable sets. Then here, this is something you would see in abstract algebra, the groups, rings, and fields. And then vector spaces you would see maybe in a linear algebra class. Topology, obviously, in a topology class. And then metric spaces also in a topology class. So that's just chapter zero. Chapter one is on complex differentiable functions. Two is on holomorphic functions. Three is on analytic functions. This is something um, you'll see for sure. You'll see a lot of this stuff, but you'll see this um, in a complex variables class at the undergrad level if you take one. Conformal mappings, you'll see that at the end of the class maybe. Um, and then this one has solutions to odd numbered problems, which I've actually used. Uh, I've used the solutions to this book. I've had this book for a long time. So some notions of set theory. We introduce here some logical symbols, which we shall use throughout this book. Let S1 and S2 be two sta statements, then the symbol S1 implies S2 means that the statement S1 implies the statement S2, right? So they just give you some, some logical symbols, which is useful. They do the bare minimum so that you can read the book and understand it. So it goes at a really fast pace. So like you can learn a lot of math just by reading chapter zero. I mean, it, like I mentioned all the courses that are covered just in chapter zero of this book. And he's really quick, he's clean. I mean, cause the goal of chapter zero is like to get through it. So it's kind of like a set of like shortened notes that covers all of these diverse topics in chapter zero. And um, I think it's really, really cool. Here it talks about a relation being an equivalence relation. So a relation is basically just a subset uh, of a Cartesian product. Yeah, here it says, let A be a set, a subset S of A cross A is called a relation in A, right? So if A is a set, so S is your relation, right? So it's just a subset of a Cartesian product, cool. I remember, I remember not understanding this. I remember like struggling to understand relation and going on the internet and like going, I think it was mathworld.com and like trying to really understand what a relation was and I just didn't get it. I'm like, what, it can't be that simple. That, that's all it is. Why are the problems so hard, <laughs> right? So I think that's what it was. I was struggling. Um, so you see relations. If you take a discrete math class, like if you're a CS major, you'll definitely see relations there or in a proof writing class. And equivalence relations are really important because they partition a set. So if you have a relation and it has these properties, so like it's reflexive, symmetric, and transitive, then um, you have an equivalence relation, So which is really cool because then you can break up your set into equivalence classes. That's used in group theory. In group theory, those are called cosets. They are the equivalence classes under a certain relation. So, and they're used in other areas of math as well. Number theory. Yeah, cool stuff. Let's look at this. Sets with an algebraic structure, groups. A set G with mapping G cross G into G, which associates with each pair A, B, A and B and G. An element of G denoted by A star B is called a group. So basically, this is just saying um, you have a binary operation. So like plus addition is a binary operation because like two and three, if you add them up, you also get a number. So if you take two numbers and you add them up, you get a number. So addition is a binary operation on the set of numbers. Let's just say 
for all practical purposes, the real numbers. And then, so if you take addition um, with the set of real numbers, then you have a group under addition. So, and these are the things that you would need for a set to be a group with a binary operation. You would need associativity. So addition is associative, so there's no issues there. The identity element, they call it the neutral element. Um, so for our addition example, that would be zero. And the inverse element. So for our addition example, if you have x a real number, negative x would be the inverse of that real number. And abelian means it's commutative. Same thing here. And so our fake example would also be commutative. Hopefully I didn't misspeak there. But yeah, really cool stuff. So I mean, this is page 10 and it's defining a group. <laughs> it's just... Now it's talking about vector spaces, right? It's all over the place, which I think is awesome um, because it just gives you like a really concise look. At, it doesn't go too deep. It just gives you the important stuff, like the stuff you really need to know. Definition of a topology right here. Beautiful, right? I actually remember referencing this when I was in topology too because I was comparing definitions because um, the book I used for topology didn't start with this definition. It started with the definition of uh, neighborhood systems. And so I had a really hard time understanding that definition. However, they later prove that if you define topology, if you define a topology through neighborhood systems, it's, it's pretty much the same as this. So you can take this as the definition also, right? That's the thing with mathematics. Um, it depends what you take as the definition. You know, there's different ways to define things. And so, you know, if you start with a certain definition, the path to a certain result might be slightly different. It's fun to have equivalent definitions or equivalences in general, right? So it's like, you know, the well-ordering principle is equivalent to mathematical induction, right? So they are, you know, if one is true, so is the other. Here's talking about interior points. The point X is called an interior point of a set S. If this backwards E means there exists a neighborhood N of X of X contained in S. In short, if S is a neighborhood of X. Cool. Sets open if all of its points are interior points. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Let's look at some of the exercise. I think the exercise has been a while since I've looked at the, yeah, there's just a few exercises in each little section, uh, but it's cool that they have some of the answers. Compact sets, compactness. How do they define compactness? Yeah, through open coverings. Yeah, there's different ways you can define uh, compact sets, especially like in metric spaces. Let's see if they have, we talk about norm metric spaces. Here we go, sequences in metric spaces, completeness, convergent sequences, a complete norm vector space is called a Bonnock space and they have some problems. Continuity in metric spaces. A subset is bounded if there's a ball containing that set. Cool. Yeah, metric spaces you study uh, and also in a topology class. This The proofs, so when you learn like advanced calculus um, and you come to this, I think there's a really nice transition that's somewhat natural. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Like, in metric spaces, it's just like the real numbers, right? Kind of, because in the real numbers, you have a distance function. That's the absolute value of X. Uh, in metric spaces, you have a generic, uh, you have a generic distance function. Let's see if I can find it. I'm sure it's in here. The definition of a metric space. Here we go. So a metric space, it's a set with a distance function, right? So um, the set of real numbers, the distance function is just the absolute value. So the absolute value of x minus y is greater than or equal to zero. If the absolute value of x minus y is zero, x is equal to y. The absolute value of x minus y is equal to the absolute value y minus x. And then the triangle inequality holds, obviously, for absolute values. That's the one that most people know. Uh, whereas here, it's more generalized, right? You're just talking about um, a, a set, so a space with a distance function on it, right? I mean, that's pretty cool. So in R squared, it's the Euclidean distance. It's like the normal distance formula that you learn like in college algebra. That's, that's the one you use. That's, the, that's your distance function uh, in, in a metric space. So uh, for R squared, that's that, with that metric, you can use different metrics in metric spaces. Um, there's some really weird ones. 
So um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So yeah, here's another, here's the metric on Rn. So the set of n tuples in n dimensional space, that's the difference between two points in n dimensional space. That's also called the Euclidean distance. Here's a weird one. The norm in this Hilbert space is that, wow. Cool, right? So there's all kinds of stuff in this book. And that's just the preliminaries, right? This book is on complex, complex variables. It's got holomorphic, I mean, so much, so much math in here. Anyways, I got carried away with showing you all this math. Um, so the video's getting kind of long, so I'm gonna stop it. Good luck.